Hi guys, well we've come to Hamble this morning to have a look at this exciting new boat. It's the X43 Mark II. The Mark I version was built from 2016 to 2021 and it's been really successful. They built over 100 of them. This one's just had a bit of an update and it's actually a new hull. The front half of the boat is exactly the same as it used to be. The back half of the boat has had a bit of a bum lift to make it wider, more powerful, but they've also lifted the chines up to give it less wetted surface area in light winds. So it should be a better all round performance. Um, we'll have a quick look and then we'll go out for a sail. So just before we head out on the water, this is the main thing that's changed about this boat. You can see the hull chine here, it's a soft chine, but it's come really far up the boat. We might see if we've got a picture of what it used to look like, but the hull's wider and further up out of the water. So you can see there's not much wetted surface area under there, but once you power the boat up, get a healing, she'll sit onto this chine and that'll give you absolutely loads of power. Luckily here in Hamble, we've got a few examples of the new one and the old boat. Uh, this is the X4, which became the X4-3. And you can see that the transom is narrower. The beam isn't carried all the way aft. And you can see this chine here comes down a lot closer to the water. So it's a bit more wetted surface area. So here we are, we're coming down Southampton water and we've got a nice 13, 14 knots of breeze, so a good force four. Almost not a cloud in the sky, things couldn't be better. We've got five of us on board. Um, we've got Zoe, and we've got Peter the owner, and we've got Stuart for uh, X Yachts GB, and then we've got Richard behind the camera. All right, let's go and do some sailing. Okay, so performance wise, uh, we're a little bit more in the groove now and we've got the boat going at about 6.7 to 7.2 knots. Um, she'll point it up to about 26, 28 degrees to the apparent wind, which is really high. But she'll sit about six and a half knots. If we come off, I don't know, four degrees to 30 to 32, we'll be nudging up over seven knots, um, which is really good, which is really good. and. Uh, Notice as well, just while we're heeled over like this, the effect of the lifted up aft chine. Got a fairly quiet wake and not too much disturbed water between us. It's letting the water run off freely. On heavier stern boats, you'll see a whole load of water being towed along with us. Um, so that's where you can sort of see the effect of the, the chine being lifted up. Okay, let's just see if we overpressure a bit. We'll keep the sails pinned in, just bear away a bit see how she handles when we are giving her too much. So we're, uh, what's that? That's a fair bit of heel there, Stuart. What do you reckon? 25 degrees. 25 degrees. So she hasn't let go of grip yet. She's still holding on, still holding on. And now she's rounding up. There we go. And back on a close hold. So I didn't lose grip there, but I couldn't, couldn't keep her pressed down. We'll try that once more. But she's certainly not letting go, not spinning up into the wind. Yeah, that's a pound wind speed, 20 knots there. Okay. So helm's pretty loaded up there. I'm having to fight that a bit. Try and keep that there at about sort of close reach. Yeah, so she's not letting go. In that one gust before, she did sort of start to force her way up into the wind, but she's not going to suddenly broach or spin through the wind if you get hit by a gust or lose concentration. It's worth saying that the Mark II uh, 4 3 has got a new design rudder. It's designed to be more powerful uh, than the previous rudder. 
but it also gives you a little bit more feedback so you can see that I can you can see what's happening with the wheel it's sort of, I'm pushing against it where on the mark one it was a slightly uh, lighter feel and you didn't necessarily get the feedback that you were over pressing the boat now the boat tells me that it's being overpressed, but it doesn't let go and suddenly give up on grip. So it's a really good combination of power, but also knowing that you need to do something about your sails. So, Peter, this is your boat. Yeah. And um, how long have you had this boat? Uh, I've had the boat uh, now in the water for about two months. Okay. Because the first boat launched probably this year. Yeah. Hamble was very quiet back then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, have you had X yachts before? Why have you gone for the X43? No, this is my first X yacht, and I uh, initially had my my sights on an X46, mm -hmm. uh, but I decided for for various reasons to go for X43 because it's. It's a little bit easier to handle, but still big enough for a family, um, and also easier in marinas, etc. 4.6 is still a bigger boat, and this is really good for family, and um, good cruising speeds, and yeah. a really good compromise. Okay. Um, so, so what kind of sailing are you going to do with her? So this year we'll probably stay on the south coast of, uh, of England, we'll go to the west country, we'll have about three, four weeks, we'll see how far we go, we'll take it by the day. Any day of sailing is good enough. So. It doesn't yeah. really matter if we get to the Scillies or just to uh, to, uh, to to Cornwall. And and you've got so you've got your family. You've got three kids. Yeah, three teenage children. Okay. So one of the reasons why I decided for this boat is that uh, it's a little bit bigger. So good uh, good cabins for for the family. Um, uh, say locker, so we can keep my downward sails there. Uh, really comfortable comfortable down below. Um, and. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good family boat uh, and also if you if you want to do passage planning you'll have a little bit more speed so to get a little bit more distance which makes it I think really good for uh, for family and uh, also I decided that the boat is, has a little bit more of uh, a faster cruising element to it so uh, so the children really like it to be more active on the boat and you know to main ship from main sheet trimming to jib trimming so and, and helming the boat so it's a little bit more fun so, uh, so you're all properly involved in, in sailing the boat and yeah, you wanted yeah. a, a real sailing boat rather than just a, yes, yeah, an uh, easy to sail cruiser. Yeah, yeah my wife mm. also and uh, uh, so yeah, all five of us like it and yeah. uh, rather than sit back and have tea or, uh, or gla a glass of wine we really like to first do a lot of sailing. Uh, so uh, yeah I look forward to a good year. And when, when you chose the boat, were there any sort of options that you knew you wanted to have, extra things that you've added to the boat? Well, I think the base, the base model of the, of the boat is all really, really well specced. But I think standard things like bow thrusters. I wanted to have two downwind sails, mm -hmm. one a bit more versatile uh, and one bigger running sail. Um, I, I think standard good navigation equipment but I, I uh, obviously a double, double cabin. Yeah. Good, well, thank you very much for letting us come for a sail today. Thank you, and it was a, good to have you on board. Right, well, I finally had the wheel prized out of my fingers. So while the other guys are sailing the boat, I thought we'd just go forwards and have a little bit of a look on deck and I can show you around and we'll have a look in the cockpit later. Right, first of all, stepping over, we've got side decks here, they're nice and broad. Uh, on the Mark II, actually, interestingly, the side decks are slightly narrower because they've made the cockpit even wider, uh, but there's still plenty of space to walk on there. Um, we've got here, you've got the um, jib sheets, Genoa sheets coming aft to the winches there. Apart from that, the decks are completely clear of lines. You can see that all the halyards come aft here under tunnels uh, under the central section of deck. Um, so they're all completely clear. This boat's been fitted with flexi teak, synthetic teak, um, and apparently most owners opt for that. It's, it's a really nice finish, looks good, uh, and it doesn't involve cutting down rainforest. So that's a big tick. Um, on deck, if you don't have that, you've got this molded um, grip 
GRP, which is nice. A few tiny little details, which are really good. But the, there's a little um, gully down here, down the side of the deck. Um, we can show you that. Uh, and that just means that the water drains off there and runs off really easily. Um, also on the Mark II, I'll show you in the cockpit, but the cockpit combing's been taken all the way off past the helm seat. So if you get green water on deck and it flows back, it doesn't end up in the cockpit sloshing all over the helmsman. So there's a few little tweaks like that that really improve the boat. Right here, we've got, um, this boat's got uh, rod rigging discontinuous. So it's a bit more option for tweaking it and getting the rig just right. We've got these really nice bottle screws here. And then little bits of detail again like this, that the um, molded tow rails have got a removable section here that's just sealed in um, where the shrouds connect to the, to the um, bulwarks. So uh, that's just sort of really neatly done. I like that. And then you've got a couple of pad eyes here. That one's for a halyard burgee. Um, and there's another one here for an outboard sheeting position for the Genoa. There's another one further off for the tweaker for the Code Zero, which we haven't got rigged. Right, at the mast, uh, you've got your towable jib cars. The control line for that ends up going through here, under the deck and back to the coach roof win winches. Just another nice little touch. We've got a um, keel stepped mast from John Mast, which is a Danish make. Um, they do all the spars on the boat. Uh, and you'll notice uh, when we were getting rigged and when we're going back in, you've got mast steps there to reach the head of the main because it's a, a stack pack, so the head of the main comes reasonably high up. So the little mast steps to, for attaching the halyard are really useful. Um, but this grip works nicely. Uh, we've got flush hatches there. That's for the forward cabin and for the forward heads compartment. Um, and then we've got two lines led aft here, uh, which go over the coach roof, just with a little bit of uh, rubbing patch there, which is nice. Uh, so the port one's for the uh, head sail furling, and this one's for the spinnaker tack line, which goes to the end of the bowsprit. Uh, then this is a little ex-yacht trademark. They've got a forward-facing window and in the forward cabin. So this is the area where you've got your headroom. So you've got loads of standing headroom all the way into the forward cabin. And then you've got a flush-mounted hatch here, which then drains, I think, down into one of those lockers. Um, and then I'll take you forwards, and we can have a look at the bow lockers. Now here we've got two separate bow lockers. The aft one is a sail locker or fenders. There we go, turn it the right way. That's on a gas strut, opens by itself. Um, and that's where we've shoved the code zero for now. Um, that's a sealed locker that is meant to be watertight. Um, it is watertight. Um, and at the bottom, if you get, do get water in it, there's a little seacock so you can drain it down into the boat's bilges. So you can drain any water out of it, but close that seacock and that's a completely watertight crash bulkhead in there. Right, and then the forward of the two bow lockers is we've got an anchor locker. Um, and in here you've got a, an electric windlass on a little shelf. You've got your remote for it there. And there's a really good deep drop. It's not quite hull depth, but it goes a long way down. Um, so there's no problem with the fall of the chain there. A little thing, it's got little rubber stoppers, it's all properly finished. And when you're looking at a boat, you look at all the little details, like the edging around the, the decking and stuff, and it's all been finished really properly. And that's why this boat commands a slightly higher price tag because of the workmanship that goes into it. Um, worth just saying, we've got below deck furling, furling line comes aft here, and then forwards, we've got uh, two attachment points on the bowsprit. The further forward is for the Jenica. The further aft one is for the Code Zero, and we're using that today. And you can crank on a bit more luff tension with that one. And then there's a bow roller hidden underneath the bow sprit, um, which you can't see. Um, and that's all sort of fitted. It's a permanent bow sprit. Um, and I think that comes as standard on the boat. Right, the other thing I forgot to mention is that on the deck here, uh, you can see that there's a panel that goes full with the cross. Underneath that is a ready-made recess for a self-tacking jib track. Take that out and you can opt for a self-tacking jib. If you don't want a self-tacking jib, this boat doesn't have it. That just gets filled in. And then some owners will also opt for the whole thing here to be covered in uh, flexi teak as well. So then you don't see these joins at all. They'll be completely hidden from sight. Right, so uh, 
I'm just going to show you around the helm uh, and show you what there is. So we've got twin wheels, uh, which are composite wheels, so they're nice and light. Um, and it's on a Jeffers steering system and there's absolutely no play in it. It's really nice and taut. Um, and that's on a pedestal. Both pedestals on this boat have got repeated chart plotters, autopilot and bow thruster control. Um, it's a retractable bow thruster on this boat. They've got a nice little handle around there so nobody's going to grab onto the wheel instead of holding onto that. Um, it's a really comfy position to helm from sitting outboard on this slightly raised combing. Any water on the deck, as I mentioned, is going to come past you, not going to get you, give you a wet bum, which is good. And when you're heeling, pop this up and you've got a foot chock there. I'll just show you that now as we give it a bit of heel. So that's a really solid position for helming from the high side. Um, and as I was doing earlier, it's also comfortable to helm from the low side. Um, to hand here, I've got engine controls. I've got a command mic for the VHF radio. Um, and then I've got the main sheet winch and main sheet traveller, which I can control really easily here. You can also helm while sitting in front of the wheel. If you're sailing solo, you potentially do that. So you can play the traveller like that. Uh, this one's got an electric winch here. There we go, so I can control that. And on the other side, I've got a conventional winch with a winch handle. Um, you don't have to have powered winches, but it's quite a nice touch, makes life a little bit easier. And if I was sailing solo, I can still, just about from the helm, reach the um, primary winches for the Genoa. There we go, try not to jibe. Sorry about that. There we go, a little wobble. So on the whole, it's a really sensibly laid out um, helm station. And actually, while we've been sailing today, the helm's been sitting behind the wheel. Main sheet's been trimmer, has been sitting just in front of it. And then somebody trimming the uh, Genoa has been sitting next to that winch. And quite a lot of us have been sitting outboard here, leaning against the guard wires, and that's a really comfy position as well. So on the whole, I think this helm position works really well. And then just to say that I've got your hydraulic adjustable backstay here, which you can reach while you're helming as well. Um, so we've had that cranked on reasonably tight. Okay, Peter, can you take the helm? And I'll just show everyone the cockpit quickly. Just give us a shout if we need to jive. Um, right, in front of the main, we've got the full width traveler which is to reach for the um, helmsman. Um, and then you can see we've got this really wide cockpit and this is something they've worked on for the Mark II. Um, there is an option, these foot chocks come out there and you can have a central table here. I quite like the idea of that option because it gives you a bit more bracing because this is a really wide cockpit, particularly if you're heeled. That's a long way down when the boat sort of tipped over, but the chocks are good for bracing against. Um, Let's have a look. So we've got the primary winches on either side. You've got these nice little cleats here, which are for the spinnaker sheets to sit in when you're not using them rather than having to tie a knot in them. Um, and then at the forward end, you've got all of the lines led aft and they sit in these little sort of recesses here with a really good bank of clutches, all nicely labelled up. Uh, and we've got a powered winch to port, non-powered winch to starboard. You could have both of them powered up if you wanted to. It'd be quite nice to have a little um, turning deflectors here so that you could take those halyards onto this winch if you wanted to do that, um, but that could be easily fitted. Um, really nice touch here is you've got these um, hinged companionway doors um, and behind them you've got some rope bins, so you do have some rope stowage. And then looking forward, we've got the spray hood, which is under a canvas cover today, and then we've got three instrument repeaters. Um, the only thing this cockpit is missing, I feel, is just somewhere to put all your little bits, water bottles, sunglasses, cameras or whatever. You can put them forwards here, that's reasonably secure. Or Peter's actually got a little canvas bag which can go on the guard wires where you can put some of your bits and bobs as well. You do have winch pockets. And then in this boat, um, we've got... Let's have a quick look there. You've just got a cockpit sole depth locker. Uh, so that's good for lines and smaller items. Um, this boat's got three cabins down below, which you'll see in a bit. But if you opt for the two cabin version, that would be a cavernous um, hull depth locker in there. So that would be huge extra stowage. Um, but this one does have uh, a longer bit here. So if you've got boat hooks and brooms and things that you need to stow, they do tuck down to the back end of that locker. Um, 
And then we've also got the lazarettes, which I'll show you. So we've got two lazarette lockers, one either side, they're identical. So that lifts up on a gas strut again. And you can see we've got loads of space in there. You've got a valise life raft, space for fenders, fire extinguishers, um, and a couple of the engine seacocks in there, I think. Uh, and also access to the steering quadrant. It's a single rudder, so that doesn't take up too much space. It's the rudder stocks under there, which is out of the way of these lazarettes. Go on. There we go, right. Right, last little thing, we've got a gas locker in here. So that's a good deep locker. There are two camping gas bottles there. They're actually raised up quite high so that they don't ever end up sitting in any water and that drains overboard. You've got space for two bottles in there and it's big enough that you can put a variety of different gas bottles in there, which is a really nice option. I like that. Right, and then at the stern, we've got a fold-down bathing platform. That's an option. You could just have that as an open transom. Sorry, as it without a bathing platform. Most people do go for a bathing platform. And if you want to, you can opt for a bathing platform that comes up to deck level, just to give you a little bit of additional sense of security so that pets, children, or possessions don't sort of roll out of the back of the cockpit. Um, but most people, I think, opt for the cockpit sole level bathing platform in this boat. Port side aft here, we've got a little deck shower which comes out with your controls uh, and wash off after you've been for a swim. So we've been out for a brilliant sail. We've had an absolutely great time on the water. We're back in harbour, tied up alongside. So we've just got a few minutes and I'll show you around down below. Right, here we are below, and it's a lovely space to come into. Um, before I show you around, just to say that this boat is the three cabin, two heads version, and you can either have two or three cabins, and you can have one or two heads. Um, in terms of you coming down the steps, you come here, you've got some nice handholds, then you've got heads to starboard, galley to port, saloon and chart table um, ahead of you, and a double cabin with a heads up in the bow. Let's start in the galley, first of all. We've got this really big L-shaped galley um, that has got loads of space, loads of workspace, um, and really good stowage. We've got a double sink here, under there. We've got a three burner stove. Um, and then this boat's got two fridges. One that's a door opening one just in front of me, there. And we've got a lift top one there. That's on a gas strut and that's really deep. Um, so you've got loads of cold stowage. Locker space is really good. You've got lockers for pans under the oven. You've got loads of drawers. Uh, and then here, this is, this is the coffee cupboard. I like this one. Your little Nespresso machine comes out on a drawer. Look at that. You've got your milk frother in there. So you don't have to do without luxuries when you're on this boat. Um, and then it's nice to see bottom opening hatches here uh, because it means when you open it, nothing's going to fall out. You can sort of peek in first. Uh, and this owner's also had a microwave installed in there. You don't have to have that. That could be more stowage. So it's a pretty sensible saloon. There isn't loads of bracing here. So if you're going to be cooking in a seaway, you might want a little bum strap there. But the oven has got a crash bar on it. Um, when you come down the companionway, when you're sailing, could well be that you need the heads, so it's nice to have the heads near the bottom of the companionway rather than having to trape through the accommodation. Um, this heads, uh, because it's got the two, three cabins, sorry, you've got two aft cabins, you actually access um, the starboard aft cabin through what is effectively the sort of the, the sink area, but the heads itself is hidden away behind here, so you've got two separate doors. So let's just go in and have a quick look. So in the heads, the door closes there, so you've just got uh, effectively a walk through into the cabin with a sink and some stowage in here. If you want some privacy, you close this door and then the heads effectively becomes an ensuite heads compartment for the starboard aft cabin. Um, if somebody wants to use the heads, 
and there's other people in the starboard aft cabin. There's another door to close it off. So you get privacy either way. So I think that's a pretty good, pretty good workaround. That means you get a good size heads cabin and you've got your three cabins as well. Right, let's come out of the heads and we'll go forwards. Right, in the saloon on port side, you've got C-shaped seating. And I think having this sort of square C-shaped seating works well because you can tuck into a corner, put your feet up and it's really comfortable. Um, centerpiece of the saloon is this cockpit table um, and that folds out. It's a massive table, but it means that both sides of the cockpit, uh, of the cabin, sorry, have it can reach the table um, and that sits on this big support under here, so that's pretty good and solid. And you have loads of people for dinner in the evening. Obviously the support for the table includes bottle stowage, what boat would be complete without it. So you've got your wine in there. Um, a nice little piece, um, fiddled area for just putting all your bits and bobs in and boats seem to accumulate those. And then a drawer in there. Uh, in terms of stowage in the saloon, stowage is a little bit limited because the tanks have been put under the seats in here. You've got fuel under this side and you've got water under that side, which keeps all of the weight central, which is really good for sailing performance. Um, but you're limited to under seat stowage uh, just at the aft end of the saloon, at the forward end of the saloon. But you have got these overhead lockers, which are top opening. They're not particularly deep, but you've got quite a lot of space in there. First aid kits, thermos flasks, all the usual bits and bobs. Um, you've also got this shelf outboard of the seats, which has got a, a solid fiddle, so stuff isn't going to fall off if the seat cushions move. Um, and at the aft end of the starboard bench, you've got a chart table. Now, if you opt for the two cabin version, you can have a full size forward facing chart table and the heads compartment gets pushed further back. On this one, they've just got a small chart table. Now, clearly most of the navigation these days gets done on deck, but I still like to have a chart table, even if it's just doing a few emails on your laptop. Um, but this one is just about big enough to accommodate a leisure folio in here. Um, and you can do a little bit of chart work. Um, and I think it's still nice to have a chart table on board. Um, also gives you a sensible place for all of your electrical switching. Um, you've got a, a radio here, uh, and there would be space to mount other instruments here in the, in the bookshelf if you wanted to do that. Uh, while we're in the saloon, let me just tell you a little bit about the construction of the boat. Uh, so under here we can see and, um, that there's actually a big old hot galvanized steel girder in there and that's the frame for the whole boat that takes all of the keel loads and all of the rig loads um, coming down from the shrouds you've actually got some carbon box sections which take the rig loads down to this steel frame and there's a couple of other boat builders that do it like this and it's actually a really good way of building a very stiff and lightweight boat because you don't need loads and loads of GRP um, steels very stiff. Um, and this boat, actually, you lift this section up, um, you undo the screws here, and there's a single lifting point. So if you want to lift the boat out of the water, you don't need um, a cradle uh, or strops to do it. Uh, there's just a, a hook comes in through here, hooks onto there, and the crane can lift the boat straight up from a single point, which is quite clever. Right, let's go and have a look in the forward cabin. So this boat's got the two heads option. So uh, you've got a heads compartment to port here, uh, which is uh, with a shower and a small heads. Did use the heads earlier and discovered that on port tack, the inlet for the toilet is a little bit high out of the water. So it was, didn't flush straight away. We had to do a tack so I could flush it, very important. Um, but uh, so that's just one tiny little niggle that I found in the boat. There aren't many. Um, then we've got this really big island berth uh, and the owner in this one has opted both for the sprung mattress and for the mattress topper. So gone for ultimate comfort. It does mean that the bed's a little bit higher, uh, but I don't think that's a disadvantage if it means you have a good night's sleep. And then lift up the bed. And under here you've got cavernous stowage. They've got sea boots, toolboxes, and all the other sort of cruising clobber that you accumulate. Um, so it's really nice to have that good big bit of stowage. 
and they've also gone for the overhead lockers in here as well. So that gives you absolutely loads of stowage space. There's a shelf on top of that. And a nice little touch is you've got that little recessed bookshelf just above the head end of the bed because with the watertight bulkhead and the, the bow locker, it means the bed's far enough aft that you get a really wide head end. And then you've got a little bookshelf for putting a, I don't know, a glass of water in your book at night or something. Um, and then other stowage, we've got the normal locker over here. So you've got shelf on one side and hanging locker on the other side. Um, the heads compartments don't have a wet locker. Um, so on this boat, they've added a rail in the aft head so that you can put your wet sailing kit up in there. Um, but that's, that's one, one little omission that I'd, I'd quite like to see a wet, a wet locker. Um, but there's really, really good light with the hull windows. You've also got this forward facing um, window in the coach roof so that I can look and I can actually see forwards in the boat. Um, but you can sit up in bed and look out of the hull windows. And then there's a really big opening hatch above, above the bunk as well. So you've got good ventilation too. And there's loads of headroom all the way up to the end of the bunk. I'm six foot one, so you've got sort of six foot two, six foot three in here. That's uh, just about sort of one, 190 metres. Uh, so really good headroom. Right, let's go and have a quick look in the aft cabins. And I think we're more or less there. Um, the poor aft cabin in here. Um, so it's a good big double bed. Um, and this owner's opted for the uh, sea berths. So there's a little pipe cot outboard on either side, which is quite useful for, sho for shoving kit bags, things you want to get out of the way. Or if you're taking friends and kids or you, you want to bung a load of children in here, for a, that's a really good secure berth for, for a little one to sleep in. Um, you've got stowage outboard there, space to sit here. And the other thing that's worth pointing out in here is the access to the engine is excellent. There's a side panel access for the engine there, but the, the whole GRP casing here also comes off. Uh, I think you have to lift the cushion out of the way. That all comes out like that, and I can get into the back of the engine there, which gives me absolutely brilliant access. Cool, and the um, starboard aft cabin is almost exactly a mirror image of that, except that in the port aft cabin, there's no... Um, cockpit locker to impede on headroom. You go into the starboard one, I'll just have to show you quickly. You can see here that headroom is a little bit more limited above the bunk uh, because this is where the cockpit locker goes. If you didn't have this cabin, that would be an enormous cockpit locker that comes down hull depth. But it doesn't actually get in the way if you're lying in bed and there's plenty of space to move around. The headlining in here is moulded headlining as it is in heads. Coming into the main saloon, you've actually got panels. Um, uh, these are padded panels, this bit's moulded headlining. But it means that you've got some really nice touches. So ventilation in this boat, open the hatches, and they open outwards, which means that the entire hatch opens, gives you loads of air, and there are two opening ones on either side. And then you've got these nice little hidden blinds. And you've got the same for the double opening hatch in the, um, in the deck head there as well. Uh, so you've got good ventilation, good light. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that we've got a keel-stepped mast um, and any water that comes from either the uh, bow locker or the comes down the mast gathers in a little um, bilge sump just where I opened up the hatch um, and you can pump that out. Right, the last thing I haven't shown you is the engine compartment. So the companionway steps lift up and in here I can flick the light on. And we've got a 45 horsepower Yamaha diesel engine um, and we've got uh, 200 litres of fuel so we've got a pretty good range on that. Um, you can see we've got a calorifier mounted above it but it's all really easily accessible. You've got side panels that open up and the rear panels in both the aft cabins so there's no part of this engine that you can't get to. Um, and then you've got oil, oil filter, sorry fuel filter, um, alternator. Um, and everything that you need to get to is, is really easy to do on this boat. So that's the X43. I hope you've enjoyed um, having a look at the test sail and having a look around down below. I think she is a lovely boat. The craftsmanship on board and how she's built is beautiful. She's clearly very stiff. Absolutely no sounds of the boat creaking as we're sailing along. Uh, performance wise, she's a really satisfying boat to sail and she's going to be a sailor's boat. She's not going to be a first boat for somebody. 
it's this is going to be somebody who really wants to get stuck into the sailing, um, fine tune the sails, and she really rewards that. But she's also got enough uh, latitude, like a car with a big engine, that if you get it in slightly the wrong gear, there's enough torque to get you out of difficulty, as it were. So if you're slightly overpowered or slightly underpowered, she'll still keep on moving really nicely. Now, um, she probably competes against boats like, I don't know, an Arcona 415 or 435 or a Dela 42 or a Grand Soleil. Um, she's not the XP, the X performance, and the XP 44 is probably a bit more like the Arcona 435, something like that. Um, and she's a, a step back from that because she's a little bit heavier with slightly less sail area. So she's definitely aimed at the sort of cruising end of the performance cruiser spectrum. Um, but I think actually for people who want to go cruising with their families, uh, they're not fussed about racing, but they want a boat that's really enjoyable and really satisfying to sail. This boat does exactly that. I could find very few gremlins on the helm. She felt beautiful on the wheel, um, and it was really difficult to find the edge of her grip, ample grip, loads of grip um, on the water. So she was really forgiving to sail as well. Um, in terms of going off cruising, I think the layout and everything works really well. So if you bought this boat, I think there would be very little that you regretted. If you wanted to do that, you would need reasonably deep pockets. Um, let me just check my figures here because um, uh, the boat that we've tested today is uh, £515,000 sterling, excluding VAT, add-on tax, and you're getting to £618,000. So clearly that's a fair old whack, but what you get for your money is a very well-built boat that sails very nicely, and you will have some wonderful cruising adventures in there. Thank you.